Welcome to the World War I History Podcast, produced by the MacArthur Memorial. We invite you to follow us on Twitter at MacArthur1880 or find the General Douglas MacArthur Memorial on Facebook. In October 2018, the MacArthur Memorial hosted a World War I symposium that focused on the year 1918. Dr. Edward Langle presented a lecture entitled, Never in Finer Company, Doughboys and Marines of World War I. I've written three books on World War I. The first one, To Conquer Hell, The Miz Argonne, 1918, which I did about 10 years ago. Then I wrote the second book called Thunder and Flames, Americans in the Crucible of Combat, 1917 to 1918, which covers the uh, battles leading up to the Miz Argonne in some detail. I'll be covering some of those today. And then my most recent book is called Never in Finer Company, the Men of the Great War's Lost Battalion, which zeroes in on four men, three of them Medal of Honor recipients, one of those being my cousin Alvin C. York, the other two Medal of Honor recipients, Charles Whittlesey and George McMurtry of the Lost, of the Lost Battalion, and the fourth, we were talking about Frederick Palmer, a very different kind of journalist, the great journalist Damon Runyon who later became the author of Guys and Dolls, if you've heard of that, the great chronicler of New York City and and Broadway, who actually was there in the Argonne Forest to interview the men of the Lost Battalion as they came out. Mitch and Bill and I were talking this morning about how difficult it is to sell World War I as a topic, and it is very, very difficult to, to sell the war as a topic, despite so much interesting material. World War I too often appears, I think, as a story of misery and gloom and slaughter with really no other dimension to it. I was recounting to to Mitch and Bill this morning, after my first book, I raised the idea with my agent to write another book on World War I. He consulted some publishers. One of the publishers came back and said, World War I has poor entertainment value. It's a direct quote. And we're really not interested in any more books on, on World War I. And I had to battle this perception in talking with people about this conflict again and again and again, even if you try to present other dimensions, particularly of the personal stories, and recognize that they're very diverse, very interesting, and they have lessons for each one of us today, it seems that the conversations keep coming back to the same topic. Well, that sure is a miserable tragedy, isn't it? And I keep saying, well, wait, there are, there are other things to talk about here, too. There, there are moments of uplift. There are moments of example. There are moments of heroism. Yeah, that, that's true, but it's really so depressing and awful, isn't it? And I think that's really the lead weight that we've all been struggling with. Mitch has done a great job in his book, 47 Days, in presenting the Mus Argonne not just as a slugfest, but as actually a victory for American forces that played a tangible role in turning the course of, of World War I at its very end. Bill has done a wonderful job in his book, Betrayal at Little Gibraltar, and kind of looking at the personal stories and the individuals, and sometimes how individual decision-making can change the course of the war. I've tried to look in the course of my own work at the soldiers, at the doughboys, to try to understand how their experiences evolved and, and changed over time, what they experienced and how they took it home and what they did with it. You can go to the battlefields today. They're getting more visitation this year than they have for a long, 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 long time. For the most part, if you visited these battlefields in the past 10 years or so, you are likely to be on your own. If you go to the Moose Argonne Cemetery that Mitch showed us, chances were you would be the only American there. Now we're getting a little bit more. But there are few battlefields in the world that are more visceral, that, that give you a profound sense of experience. I know Mitch and Bill have been to the battlefields. Have any of you been to the battlefields before? Just uh, Chris has been, and, and you've been. Everybody should go there. Every American should go there. 
you can walk into trenches. You can see, and I'll talk about the Lost Battalion a little bit later, if you walk down the ridge where the Lost Battalion was isolated, you can still see their foxholes. You can kick some leaves away, as I've done, and spent cartridges will roll out. I found the remains of a flare pistol that the men of the Lost Battalion used to signal their positions. You can also find some pretty dangerous stuff if you're not careful, so it's important not to dig around too deeply. But let me try to give you a brief chronicle of the Doughboys' experiences of the war and end up with my four men of the Lost Battalion. General Pershing, who you see on the left, with Charles Summerall, who would become commander of the 1st Division, Big Red 1, shared a belief in common with most of his commanding officers, and, and Mitch alluded to this earlier, almost hearkening back to the French cult of the offensive of 1914. Pershing believed that by the time the United States entered the war in 1917, that the French and the British and the Germans had all become corrupted, and he used that word. They had all become demoralized by trench warfare, and they had become dependent on trenches, on heavy artillery, on machine guns, on poison gas, and they'd lost any sense of individual initiative that they may once have had. This kind of connects back to an old idea that dates even back to the 18th century of a, of a specifically American way of war that's different from the way Europeans fight. We've long cherished this idea that Europeans don't know how to think independently and only we Americans do. I have friends at, uh, who teach at West Point and they say one of the first things they have to do when they work with uh, the cadets is to, to break them of this idea that Americans are the only people who know how to hide behind trees in the world. That's the way they put it. And that uh, Europeans all just understand how to march in the open. Pershing believed that the best way to break the trench stalemate was simply to decide that it didn't exist. To regain control of the battlefield by emphasizing again, the individual soldier with his rifle and bayonet and his aggressiveness and his desire to impose his will on the enemy and his willingness to be flexible, his ability to improvise. Pershing argues the best way to break the trench warfare stalemate is simply to get out of the trenches and attack. You can see it's not a terribly sophisticated concept in many ways, but it is a doctrine that underlies much of the American attitude toward the war. Unpreparedness is the defining word for American forces in World War I. We simply were not ready for a war on this scale in Europe with these forms of weapons. Pershing and his officers, once our troops arrive in Europe, push an idea that we have something to learn from the French and the British, but we must be careful not to learn too much, for lack of a better phrase. Again, the word corrupted appears over and over again if you look at the, the primary sources of uh, American officers, uh, general and staff officers, kind of stressing about how we're training with the French and the British as we prepare to move toward the front. There's a sense that, well, we should learn something from them, but if we spend too much time with them, they're going to teach our troops to simply hunker down in the trenches and lose their initiative. This is one of my favorite pictures that I found in the, in the National Archives because I think it captures a little bit of that mood which works its way down to the individual doughboys. These are French officers training American troops in how to use their gas masks. And I love the um, expression of this soldier on the right this kind of this kind of skepticism like you really expect me to put that thing on and once the Americans get to the front proportionately they suffer much higher casualties from poison gas than the troops of any other nation 
and you can't just ascribe that to to lack of experience and lack of training but more to an attitude of mind. The Americans don't like wearing these masks because they obstruct their vision. And they don't take the things that they're told about the dangers of poison gas as seriously as they should. There are cases where the uh, Americans at the front come under gas attack and they put their masks on and they can't see very well, which is frustrating. The eyepieces tended to fog up and it was very hard to breathe. It was extremely uncomfortable. You can understand that. So what some of them would do was peel the gas masks off and just hold the ventilator in their mouth, the mouthpiece in their mouth, and they imagined that they could they could move forward effectively that way, which, of course, didn't help if you were under mustard gas attack or practically any other form of attack. Many Americans, including uh, one of my ancestors, we had the question about the Veterinary Corps, uh, one of my ancestors was uh, fighting with a 42nd Division in a machine gun unit, and I later found an account of how he got gassed, which was he came under gas attack, and he was so preoccupied with fitting a gas mask onto one of his horses that he didn't cover himself up quickly enough, and that's how he got a whiff of gas. Many, many, many American troops did not report the the um, inhalation of gas. They just figured, well, I'll get over it. I got a whiff of gas. I'm not feeling too well, but I'll get over it so I won't report as a casualty. Thousands of them came home and ended up dying early deaths because of that, including my ancestor. I would argue that the casualty figures that we see for the Ms. Argonne, for example, should actually be much higher than they are, particularly because of gas casualties. As, uh, as Mitch mentioned, we moved to the front resisting the idea of amalgamation in its more extreme form, which the British and the French have been proposing, particularly the French, arguing that American troops should put on their uniforms and fight under their officers. But we have to compromise. The Germans launch their offensive along the Eastern Front their first of a series of offensives on March 21st, 1918, push at least for a time the French and the British into a panic. And even though our troops have not become seriously engaged much to this point, we rush our troops up to the front. And for the most part from the spring of 1918 up through the late summer of 1918, our troops fight under French and British command. And they are broken down, although they wear American uniforms and they're under the immediate command of American officers, they're broken down as far as the company level, from company to battalion to regiment to division and to corps, fighting under French and British officers who make decisions for them. There are a whole series of battles, which I can just go through very quickly, that we engage in first the 1st Division around Cantini, late May, Bella Wood, which I'll talk about shortly, Chateau Terry, the 3rd Division, Bella Wood, 2nd Division, um, and then uh, the uh, Battle of Soissons a short time, a short time later, the 1st and 2nd Divisions attacking towards Soissons, and then a series of engagements where we begin to push the Germans back and more and more American troops get involved, leading up towards Saint Mihel, and then finally the Meuse Argonne driving up in this direction as one of a series of concentric attacks. Bellow Wood is a fascinating moment in the history of the United States military, and I've given whole talks on the subject. Much of my book, Thunder and Flames, is taken up with, uh, with Bellow Wood. Bellow Wood is the first major battle that American troops fight in Europe in the history of our country, beginning in early June of 1918. It's known as a battle in which the Marines, Marine Corps, entered the 20th century and came to be known as Teufelhunden, or Devil Dogs. The role of the Army in Bella Wood is generally passed over and forgotten. But Bella Wood is representative, I think, in many ways of the path that the Americans took into experience of modern warfare. The Marines assault into Bella Wood in essentially parade ground fashion. They are launched by one of my villains of the war, General James Harbord. 
who really takes very little uh, effort to to develop any any sense of tactics or to use the Marines creatively. He simply flings them into the woods in frontal assaults, and they take brutal casualties. The Army is also involved at multiple points, also taking heavy casualties. But the interesting thing here is, yes, there is absolutely a shock effect on the Germans. If you look at the German sources, you can see that they're stunned, first by the Marines, by their aggressiveness, their willingness to take heavy casualties, and their desire to keep pushing forward, which is something the French and the British had essentially forgotten by this point. They were much more cautious. And later on, even by all draftee divisions, like the 77th Division from New York, which I'll talk about, showed great aggressiveness and the desire to keep fighting and an unwillingness to surrender. It does have a shock effect on the Germans. I had originally looked at Pershing's idea of an American way of war, of the the individual soldier with his rifle showing individual initiative as being almost childish. And at certain times, there's no doubt that it resulted in heavy casualties and unnecessary casualties. But in certain places, at certain times, Pershing was proved right. And I find Pershing to be a fascinating and very complex man, not a villain by any means, but a man with flaws, but also a man of great vision and accomplishments at times. As the Marines enter into Bella Wood and they begin to fight day after day after day in this environment, they fall outside of command control. They're not able to, to uh, seek guidance from officers whether at the division or the regimental level or even the battalion or company level. As they're fighting in the woods in mid-June, ultimately it comes down to individual Marines making individual decisions on how to carry forward the battle. They end up breaking through the German lines in Bellow Wood on June 11, 1918, and we don't even know exactly how they did it. We know that they found as they were assaulting, again, harbored showing very little creativity, simply flinging them headlong, but the individual Marines and their field officers making decisions and improvising on the spot. We know that they found a jointure in the German lines of a, a place where two German regiments joined and were not cooperating with each other. We know that they found a small ravine, and we know that some Marines, we don't know the names of a single one of these, of these men, some Marines found this gap, exploited it, pushed through, and fanned out to take the Germans on either side from behind and ended up breaking the central German positions by doing this. There were multiple episodes in World War I as the fighting moves forward where this type of thing happens. The other interesting thing here is that the Marines, as Army troops would later do, learn incredibly quickly. And one measure of that is dirty tricks. I found this completely fascinating in, in the official records uh, and the unpublished records of Bellow Wood. As the Marines enter Bellow Wood, the Germans who are holding Bellow Wood are seasoned, determined troops. And they play dirty tricks. In an environment like this, the rules of war have a tendency to dissolve. They do such things as seemingly almost innocent things, such as uh, communications are very difficult in these woods, so they did actually use bugles to call advance, retreat, and different maneuvers. The Germans learn the American bugle signals and send buglers up to the front to, to play to um, to play the retreat or other types of uh, orders at different points, or to shout out in English commands. You can't tell where those commands are coming from in order to confuse them. They also do such things as the false surrender, which is a tried and true, if dirty, military tactic where German troops would emerge from the woods with their hands up and waving a white flag, and as soon as the Marines emerged to take them prisoner, the Germans would fling themselves down, and machine guns that were sighted behind them would open fire. That happened multiple times to wearing American uniforms and infiltrating the American lines to confuse them. All of these things happened initially, but it's very interesting within a few days, as you look at the German records, 
Well, guess what? The Marines start doing exactly the same thing. They start using German bugle signals, calling out orders in German, employing false surrenders, and yes, at times putting on German uniforms and infiltrating German lines. It's an arc of how quickly the Americans learned and how willing they were to push the envelope, so to speak. And this is something that you see all across the front. Another element of this war, and it's, it's kind of an unfortunate one, is we get so much about the, uh, the Franco-American alliance and how wonderfully we cooperated. Uh, there have been books written on the subject which suggests that although Foch and Pershing did almost come to blows and uh, fist fight, which is true, that on the whole the French and the Americans cooperated very well. That's unfortunately only sometimes true. Much of the time there was profound friction between the French and the Americans, and in particular certain American officers, including Bullard, who despised the French and suggested he'd rather be fighting them than the Germans at times, the Americans find it at times convenient to build up their own reputations by slandering the French. Again and again and again, and this is true in the lead up to Bellow Wood, the suggestion is made that the French were all broken, that they were running away, that they had been routed by the Germans, and that it was only the American troops who arrived, whether Marines or Army, and they saved Paris. You will see planned French movements, tactical withdrawals, or simply reliefs taking place in the lines of which the Americans were fully aware and had been informed that are presented to the public as French all-out retreats. And I found a document in the National Archives written in 1919, which was an Army PR piece, saying we need to present this as the standard narrative of the war, that the French were running away and that we came in and saved their bacon. I find this very unsettling. Again, it didn't happen all the time across the board. At times, the French and Americans cooperated very well. But the French fought like lions in 1918, even if they adopted somewhat more cautious tactics. The American troops have gained a great deal of experience through the summer of 1918, and so many encounters that I don't even have time to get into. These are troops who come from multiple backgrounds. One characteristic of the United States Armed Forces, American Expeditionary Forces, is how heavily immigrant they are. There's an editorial in the New York Times about this recently, about how hyphenated Americans, as the author put it, won the war. I, I don't know if I'd go quite that far, but in certain units, for example, the 77th Division and then, ironically, the 82nd Division, the All-American Division, as it was called, in which Sergeant York fought, were very heavily populated by immigrant troops who had come from places like Germany, Austria-Hungary, Poland, Italy, many of them from Asia, many of them from other parts of the world, and quite a few of them had not even been naturalized yet. When the 77th Division moved into lines, and this division was taken from draftees from greater New York, uh, the Germans reported that an Italian division had moved into the line because they heard them talking to each other in Italian in the trenches. Also, African-American troops go through their own trials and experiences in the summer and autumn of 1918. There are some incredible stories here of the 92nd Division and the 93rd Division. The 92nd Division fighting under American command under white officers really not being handled well in the Miz-Argonne and, and undergoing difficult trials. The 93rd Division fighting under French command and wearing French helmets somewhat to the left of the Miz-Argonne and fighting with great success and great honor. There were numerous Medal of Honor recipients in this, in this division. But let me get to talk as I finish this up about some of the individuals. One hundred years ago, in the first week of October 1918, the 77th Division, again taken from Greater New York City for the most part, with an intermixture of troops who had been pushed in to the division as replacements who had come from the Mountain West, from places like Mo Montana, Nevada, and Wyoming, pushed in with these New York City gangsters uh, and 
and fruit cart vendors and elevator operators and, and all the rest. The 77th Division was flung into the Argonne Forest in a frontal assault as part of the Ms. Argonne Offensive on the left side of the American lines. It is ordered to attack again and again and again into this, into this forest against very dense and entrenched German positions. On October 2nd, 1918, the 1st and 2nd Battalions of the 308th Regiment assault into the woods and find a gap in the German lines that appeared simply by chance. Charles Whittlesey, who commands the 1st Battalion, with his number two man, George McMurtry, who's commanding the second battalion. They've been merged together. Whittlesey is a major, McMurtry is a captain. Follow orders to advance without attention to their flanks. They have been told by their colonel, who has been told by the brigadier general, who has been told by the major general, who has been told by Liggett, who has been told by Pershing. They must push forward at all costs pressure is being brought to bear from above. So Whittlesey continues to advance into the forest, pushes ahead to a ravine, advances to the steep northern slope of the ravine beneath the road and digs in. And within a few hours, the Germans have sealed off his point of entrance and surrounded him at all sides. Whittlesey must command these troops who come from profoundly different backgrounds from his over the next several days. Whittlesey is a New York City lawyer. He's one of the blue bloods who we believe should be commanding our troops at this time. His number two man, George McMurtry, is a millionaire stockbroker of Irish-American heritage, and his troops are of completely different social set, social class. A scholar I heard recently argued that by 1918, if you want to find an aristocratic officer corps, you need to go to the Americans. Because the American officer corps was deliberately chosen from the best, the very best of society, from men who had been trained with a sense of civic duty and social obligation to their fellow countrymen, a sense that every life depended on them that they had been given so much by society that they had to give everything back. This was their mentality. Charles Whittlesey commands the men in the pocket with this in mind. Day after day, they have no food. They have no medical supplies. They have little ammunition. They have very little water. The only water comes from a spring that's under German sniper observation. Many Americans are killed in trying to get water from the spring. They come under bombardment from their own artillery. They're attacked by German stormtroopers bearing flamethrowers and grenades day after day after day, and they hold out. And Whittlesey and George McMurtry move from hole to hole to encourage their men and to tell them to hold on. Ultimately, the men come to depend entirely on each other. And this is the eternal soldier's experience, veteran's experience, and it's one that never becomes more vital or more authentic than those five days in the pocket and what came to be called the Lost Battalion. These men from different backgrounds depend entirely on each other and entirely on their officers to hold out. Alvin York of the 82nd Division is involved in the action to turn the Argonne Forest. As Bill was pointing out, it did happen. It was a deliberately planned turn of the German positions that ends up liberating the Lost Battalion. Each of these men comes home, and each of them is treated as a hero. Each of them receives a Medal of Honor. But each of them carries a different burden and does something differently with it. And this this is why World War I is so important, because it changed individuals. And these changed individuals came back to their country, and they changed their families, their communities, and their society. And their individual stories are compelling and profoundly important. In November of 1921, Charles Whittlesey, and you see him here, I, I urge you just to look at their faces and George McMurtry on the ship that's carrying him home. Just look at his face. 
November of 1921, they are employed as honorary pallbearers at the interment of the unknown soldier in Arlington Cemetery. And as Alvin York is there too, and as the ceremony is taking place, Charles Whittlesey turns to George McMurtry and says, George, I shouldn't have come. I can't help but thinking that's one of my men. And I will hear their cries tonight. And a few days later, Whittlesey boards a ship, like the young women that Mitch was telling us about, boards a ship to the Caribbean and leaves a few notes behind for friends and family and steps overboard. Because he is consumed by guilt, a sense of responsibility for every single man who died or who suffered in that pocket. George McMurtry takes the note that's written to him, and he never tells us what, he, what it said, but he burns it. He struggles to return to his family. His personality has changed. He dedicates himself to the survivors of the Lost Battalion, and every year when they meet, he lifts a glass and he recites words that Whittlesey had said when they marched out of that pocket, and he says, gentlemen, we shall never be in finer company than we are today. And he finds some peace in devoting himself to the survivors. Alvin York finds his peace by taking all the celebrity and all of the money. He's given a home. He's given thousands of dollars, a new farm. He doesn't take any for himself, but he devotes it to serving the less fortunate and the people of his native East Tennessee and the Alvin York Foundation. And he too finds peace. He too, who struggles with a terrible sense of guilt for every man he had killed, and he killed men face to face with his pistol in that action in the Argonne, and he's consumed by guilt. He eradicates that guilt through giving and through charity. And finally, the last of my four men, Damon Runyon, the great journalist, a great New York City sports writer, chronicler of the World Series, of Jack Dempsey, the boxer, of the Kentucky Derby, of all these, these tough guys and high rollers and, and women and dames from New York City. He was there when they came out of the pocket. He interviewed them. He tells their story in columns through the New York American and says, these are individuals like us, these immigrants, these nobodies, these blue bloods, they all came together in that pocket, and they all became part of the American pageant. He becomes the storyteller that brings their story to us. And he ends his life in 1946, or his life ends, I should say, uh, because of uh, throat cancer. He ends with a final gesture by the terms of his will. He asks Eddie Rickenbacker, the great ace, his friend, to fly over New York City with Damon Runyon's son and to empty his ashes over Times Square, deliberately bringing together the war, Eddie Rickenbacker, New York himself, and the stories of individual Americans in that one gesture, trying to say it's all part of us. It all comes together. And to me, it's those individual stories that tell us and show to us these people are ourselves. They belong to us, and we need to do them honor. Thank you. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, suggestions, or comments, please contact Amanda Williams at amanda.williams at norfolk.gov.